Good evening. Welcome to the September 28th, 2020 City Council meeting. I will now call the meeting to order. Please note that this meeting is being attended by City Council and staff via Zoom teleconference. Thank you for your patience as we continue to navigate city business through this meeting process. For the benefit of the public and as required by the Brown Act, the vote will be by roll call. City Clerk, could you please take roll? Yes, Mayor Sistarsik? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Kalmet? Here. Council Member Moore? Here. Council Member Masalaba? Here. Council Member Verapapa? Here. All present. Okay, thank you very much. We'll move on to the approval of the agenda and waiver of full reading of resolutions and ordinances. Does anyone want to pull a consent calendar item? Okay, seeing none. City Clerk, do we have any supplemental communications? Yes, Mayor, we received seven supplemental communications. We've updated the website to reflect them and we've also emailed them to the council members. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, could I get a motion to approve the agenda? Motion to approve. Okay, is there a second? Second. Oh. Oh. Somebody in there. Give it to Mike. Okay. Uh, City Clerk Harper, could you take the vote by roll call, please? Mayor Sistarsik, how do you vote? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Kalamik, how do you vote? Yes. Council Member Verapapa, how do you vote? Yes. Council Member Moore, how do you vote? Yes. Council Member Masalabit, how do you vote? Yes. Okay, that's 5 0. Thank it passes. Thank you very much. We'll move on to presentations and recognitions. Uh, Seal Beach COVID 19 Local Emergency Review. I'd like to call upon Chief Gonchek for this presentation, please. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, City Council, City Staff, City Manager Ingram, all who are listening and who are watching in tonight. I'm going to run through uh, some brief numbers here for statewide. Here in California, currently, there's a total case count of 805,263 confirmed COVID-19 cases with 15,608 deaths. We continue to have the highest case count in the nation and are now fourth for deaths behind New York, New Jersey, and Texas. Here are the most up-to-date Orange County numbers. Orange County has a total of 53,448 cases. We have 1,216 deaths. The age breakdown is 880 of them are age 65 and over. 280 of those deaths are age 45 to 64. 33 of those deaths are age 35 to 44. 18 are age 25 to 34. Four are aged 18 to 24, and only one is under the age of 18. The gender difference, there's males with 693 of those deaths and females with 517. Orange County hospitals are now down from our last city council meeting with 161 cases being hospitalized, 46 of them in the intensive care unit. Next, some boring municipality and Seal Beach data. The city of Long Beach, as of Saturday, has 11,843 cases being reported with 234 deaths. City of Huntington Beach with 2,396 cases. Cypress now at 550 cases. Los Alamitos with 180. Garden Grove at 2,942. Rossmore with 67, City of Westminster with 1,032, and here in Seal Beach, we now have a confirmed total of 277 cases according to the Orange County Health Authority website. As in the past, based on the way that I've explained this, the state and the county are reporting these 277 Seal Beach COVID-19 cases as 179 of them appearing to actually be Seal Beach residents. The remaining 98 can be directly attributed to the Seal Beach Health and Rehabilitation Skilled Nursing facility outbreak. With that, we still receive a daily report directly from the skilled nursing facilities. Because of this, I'm happy to report that since August 4th, 2020, there has been only one employee who has tested positive for COVID-19 and no patients. Prior to August 4th, as most of you are aware, there were reportedly 128 skilled nursing facility residents and 106 healthcare workers who tested positive. 23 of those skilled nursing facilities ended in death, unfortunately. Since our last communication, the Seal Beach Health and Rehab Center has been now divided into three specific units that are color-coded with green, yellow, and red. 
The green unit is comprised of occupants or residents who have spent 14 days prior in yellow quarantine and were ultimately found to be COVID-19 free and or were not symptomatic of any other illnesses. The yellow unit is used to test and quarantine new residents who enter the facility for a 14 day period. The red unit is then used to isolate any residents who are infected by COVID-19 or those who become symptomatic while in that yellow 14 day period. The healthcare workers are then assigned to each unit and can only work in that particular unit to prevent cross-contamination. N95 masks and additional PPE gear are utilized in each unit. As of September 28th, each unit has the following number of residents in them. Green with 111, yellow at 38, red zero, for a total of infected residents and or workers at zero, and a total of 149 residents being inside both of those units. Moving on, the Orange County Fire Authority calls for service involving infectious diseases from September 1st to the 27th of September, has totaled 1,748. Seal Beach is roughly 2.8% of all those calls for service with a total of 49. This is an increase of just over half of 1% compared to recent weeks. Lastly, before I turn it over, I wanna advise everybody that the Los Alamitos High School starts their first day of 2020, 2021 on-campus hybrid instruction tomorrow. And we wanna wish everyone a safe experience. It's because of this we ask all staff, and or students to please be careful, be mindful of others' personal space, and most importantly, follow all the recommended Los Alamitos Unified School District safety guidelines. In closing, this completes my report. Unless there are any questions for me specifically, I'll pass it back to you, Mayor or City Manager. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, City Council, did any of the members have a question for Chief Gonchak? Okay, thank you very much, Chief, for that report. We'll move on to a presentation uh, by Southern California Edison. I'd like to call upon Senior Policy Advisor James Peterson, please. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. James Peterson for Southern California Edison. Tonight, uh, we're grateful for the opportunity to present to you an update on some of the things that we've been working on, uh, and including some of the things related to COVID. Next slide, please. So as a reminder, the scope of our system is pretty uh, uh, pretty large. We cover 50,000 square miles. Our territory stretches from the southern end of Orange County, uh, well up into Santa Barbara County, up into the Sierras, and on the backside of the eastern slope of the Sierras, uh, including Pomona Lake. That encompasses uh, uh, 4,600 circuits, 1.5 million poles, uh, well over 100,000 miles of transmission and distribution lines. Next slide. So to maintain that system, we have to spend about $5 billion a year in, um, in both maintenance and in upgrades. And that includes uh, just in the past year, uh, about 180 miles of underground cable that had to be replaced. Um, 4 3, 4, 4,300 uh, transmission poles were replaced, underground structures, um, and also maintaining grid readiness. In terms of COVID, next slide, please. Um, we need to maintain that system, which means we're gonna to continue to need to have some outages uh, despite COVID. And we know that there are significant impacts on families staying at home. And it's great news to hear that, that students are gonna be able to return to school, at least in a hybrid fashion tomorrow. Um, but we need to maintain that system. So uh, unfortunately, that means that some people are gonna to need to uh, telecommute and also go to classes while power might have outages. We've been working really hard to schedule those outages at times that it won't impact uh, distance learning and telecommuting. And we put in a number of other enhancements so that we can shorten the duration of outages when we have to have them. The first six months of COVID, we were really limiting the kind of work that we were doing to essential work. So that was anything related to wildfire emergencies, for example, someone hits a pole, we need to replace it. Um, and things that were vital to maintaining the grid for, for safety reasons. We're beginning to have to look at some additional areas of projects that have been delayed. Uh, businesses have been waiting to be powered up, um, new ho housing developments and that sort of thing that we need to really get done in the next, uh, the next few months before the year ends. But while we do that, we have a slew of mitigation strategies and we look at every single outage on a case by case basis to really try to minimize the impact to our customers. 
Uh, we're also working to try and alleviate the, the financial impact of COVID on our customers. Um, we are, we're not turning off power for anyone who doesn't have the ability to pay their bill. We have some budget tools on our website that allow you to calculate what your bill will be and kind of balance it out over the year and also do some projections of what your expected upcoming bills will be. We have a number of other programs. For example, uh, if we could go to the next slide. We have, we have these other programs that, um, that are helpful to some customers. So for example, our medical baseline program, which is meant for customers that have uh, medical devices that require energy. We have some new discounts on that and also qualifying for that program. We made it a little bit simpler um, before it required a doctor's, a doctor's note and we've kind of um, modified those requirements to make it easier for people to qualify. We also have our care program. Both our care and medical baseline programs come with financial assistance. So by signing up for them, not only do you, uh, do you get the benefit of, uh, of being part of that program, you get alerts on any kind of outages, but the, the bill that you're uh, assessed because you're using a medical uh, electric powered medical device, we give you a discount of about 30%. So it's really uh, a great program and uh, we really encourage cities to try to encourage their residents to sign up for it. One, because they get notifications of outages and we work really closely with those customers to minimize the impact to them, but also you get this great discount. Next slide. As I was mentioning, we know that there is significant impact for, for people working from home and studying from home. So we have these tips here where we are encouraging uh, residents to learn about some of the programs and ways to be prepared for those outages when they do occur. And we actually have a, a battery rebate program that offers $50 off of uh, battery packs. You can use those to plug into your router and maintain that Wi-Fi connectivity. So that will allow you to continue to, to work from home, even if you don't have you know, power to your lights for a few hours. If you have a student or someone working from home, they can stay connected and continue with those classes. We also encourage uh, people to, to look at Wi-Fi hotspots as an alternative. And these are good tips, regardless if there's a, an outage, a planned outage, or if there is some other kind of event that causes your power to go out. It's always good to have these, whether or not we're dealing with COVID or, or some other situation. Next slide. Another key thing that we continue to work on, again, despite COVID and some of the other challenges we're facing right now, is our Pathway 2045. And that's the plan that we first developed in 2017 to, to meet the state's goals for uh, decarbonizing the uh, the energy sector, our goal is by 2045, we're gonna have 100% of the power that we use to deliver to homes and businesses come from renewable sources. We know that there's only so much we can do in terms of the power to reduce the carbon emissions in terms of the way that we produce power. So we're investing heavily in terms of electric uh, transportation uh, so that that's, we know that's one of the largest sectors of carbon emissions and we put it uh, considerable effort into um, charging stations for electric vehicles. And we just recently, within the last month, got approval from the California Public Utilities Commission to invest in about 38,000 new charging stations. And we welcome the opportunity to work with the city on, on those charging stations. Essentially, the program allows us to subsidize the cost of the installation of the stations, uh, paying for the portion from the pole to the charging station. So I'd love to talk to you more about that and make it help, hopefully make it part of your sustainability plan. The other area that we're really focusing on is electrifying buildings. And we know this is gonna happen over generations. It's not something that happens overnight, but as homeowners and as business owners look to replace uh, old equipment, there's a major opportunity to reduce carbon emissions by converting to electric, um, electric sources of energy. This is a long-term effort, um, but we're working closely with the governor's office and the state legislature and our regulators to make sure that we're doing our part to have a clean energy future. Next slide. Next major issue that we're working on is, is wildfire. And you've all seen the news in recent days how significant the fires are up north and even 
even up in LA with the Bobcat fire. Um, the Creek fire up in the Sierras is one that's directly impacting our company. We have a, our oldest generation facility, a hydroelectric facility uh, called Big Creek. And the fire, uh, the Big Creek fire surrounded that facility and damaged uh, homes as well as uh, different lines that go into that. That directly impacts people in Orange County because that's, that's a major source of generation for us. So even though the fires might be far away, it does have a very significant impact. Um, it's, it's an issue that we've been working with the state with uh, for the last few years, but the, the situation um, is going to be with us for quite a while. Just, just this year, you can see the numbers there in the slide, how dramatic the difference has been. It's, uh, it's been the worst seven fires, and the worst seven fires of the last 10 have happened just since 2017. And unfortunately, a lot of the areas that we provide service to are in these high fire risk areas. And you can see on the map, the, the orange areas and then the darker colors, those are different uh, tiers of high fire risk areas. And thankfully, Seal Beach is not one of those areas. But again, to the point I just made, when there are fires anywhere in our service territory or anywhere near our generation or transmission lines, it does have an impact on our ability to live, deliver power. Next slide. So here are some of the things that we're doing uh, to address the wildfire threat. Uh, we've installed uh, all kinds of equipment to monitor for fires. Uh, that's the wildfire cameras, weather stations. We also have something called cover conductor or insulated wires. It's a, essentially a, a layer of plastic that goes up on top of our wires so that if a tree or anything should impact a line, it prevents that line from triggering a, a wildfire because it's sealed in this plastic. That's a, a tool that we're using widely and we're gonna continue to add um, you know, thousands of miles in the years to come in areas uh, focused first on areas where there's high wildfire threats. Uh, we also have on, on board uh, meteorologists that are on 24 seven monitoring weather conditions. And uh, that then leads us into the next slide. What those meteorologists help us do is look at where we might need to uh, de-energize our lines in what we call the public safety power shutoff program, where we take very specific segments of our transmission lines, uh, even just a portion of a single circuit offline because they're in an area where there's, there is very low humidity, very high winds, and the possibility that something could come into contact with our lines and trigger a wildfire. Again, Seal Beach is not an area that's gonna be impacted by this, but you're very likely to hear about it from residents who have questions wondering if this might happen in your area. Uh, when these happen, they tend to get a lot of press coverage and there are a variety of different kinds of outages. And it can be a bit confusing for the customer understanding what areas are impacted and will there be power shutoffs? And, and never say never, but it's highly, highly unlikely that a PSPS event would ever occur in Seal Beach. It's, uh, it's something really meant for those high fire risk areas. And you can see here how far in advance we're looking uh, to de-energize de a line. And we are in constant communication with local officials and um, the Emergency Operations Center in Orange County and others, uh, alerting them to the possibility of a power shutoff. Next slide. So this next portion is the annual, um, the annual reliability review that we're required to do through the CPUC. We file reports with them for every single jurisdiction that we work with. And it speaks to how our circuits are performing in each, each city. Next slide. And we define reliability in a couple of, of different ways. Um, there are outages that, that are planned for and outages that are not, both those get categorized in this report. And then it, we produce uh, some numbers on how frequent those outages might occur and what was the cause, what was the duration of the outage. Um, and what we consider a sustained outage is anything that's lasting greater than five minutes. It's not the momentary flicker that you, you might see sometimes. Next slide. And these first two categories, SADI and SAFI, SAFI speaks to the duration of an outage and SAFI speaks to the frequency of an outage. Next slide. Um, 
where we have 14 circuits in your city. Next slide. And this map shows us where those circuits are. It's probably a little hard to read, but I'll follow up with staff and provide them a, a more detailed copy of this map that you can zoom in on if you have questions. And the reason why these circuits are, are worth knowing is that later on in the report, you can look and see exactly what the performance level was for each circuit within your city. So if there's a particular council district or a particular neighborhood that you wanted to know more about, how do we do in that area of the city? The slides at the back of this deck will show you that. Next slide. And this is the, the main slide that speaks to how we're doing um, in your city. So you can see overall on the last column in 2019, and this data is all data captured in 2019. We'll have another report early next year on 2020. But you can see overall that, um, that in Seal Beach, the duration of an outage is almost half of what it is in the rest of our service territory. That 92.6 represents 92.6 minutes of, for the, um, the duration of an outage, so essentially an hour and a half. And then the question is, how often does that happen for a typical uh, household or business in the city? And under safety, you'll see it happens about once a year. So typically in, in your city, um, if someone uh, is wondering how often the power goes out once a year, how long does it last? Hour and a half. So next slide. And this breaks down the causes of that the, um, the outages. So you can see that half of it was from equip equipment failures. There's a piece of equipment that, that broke essentially. Um, the number tends to be higher for equipment failure in coastal cities because the, the salinity impacts our lines and it causes them to fail more often. Additionally, uh, some of our vaults that are, that are underground uh, tend to get inundated with water. It's just a common phenomenon in all the coastal cities. Um, that's why a lot of times we really try to put those structures above ground so that there isn't the inundation. Um, uh, but those are the, the basic reasons. And then you'll see what the other major categories are. It's even down to you know, whether an animal came into contact with, with one of our lines or um, in other examples, we might have a, a mylar balloon which hits our lines and takes it down. Um, and those are the basic categories. And then the next slide uh, breaks it down in terms of those same categories, but by the frequency, how often um, um, are the incidents caused because of equipment failure and, and the other reasons here. The slides that follow are like what I was mentioning. Uh, that's a citywide slide on the next one. That shows you how we've been doing quarter by quarter over the last few years. And then the following slides, the next, I think, four or five pages, they show, they show you the individual circuits or neighborhoods of the city that have uh, had outages and what the frequency and duration was. So if you then go to slide 23, those are just some, some good, um, good uh, power outage safety tips that I thought would be useful for residents. And the final slide, um, are some, some contact numbers. So in case you have a question or an outage uh, concern, that there's our phone number listed there. The, the thing about the sign up, and I'll just highlight that one. Um, one thing that, that a lot of customers aren't aware is just because we have your, your address, we don't have the ability to quickly communicate with you unless you go to our website and sign up for our alerts. Our alerts uh, allow us to contact you by text, and by phone or by email. And that's the quickest way to stay informed about what's happening with, it, with an outage, uh, regardless if it's, if it's planned, unplanned, um, and just get the best available information. So we strongly encourage uh, residents to sign up for that so that you can know very quickly what's happening with the system and get those updates from us. That wraps up my presentation and I'm happy to answer questions uh, if the council has any. Okay, uh, did anyone on the council have questions for Mr. Peterson? I had a quick question. Okay, Mr. Rarepapa. Yeah, um, in regards to people telecommuting and stuff, do you see a decrease in power usage with like many, you know, mid rises and high rises because um, they're not being used as much? And what type yeah. of direction? is given to those um, type of facilities. I know 
obviously you can't shut down a building, but I know like residents are told to put the temperature at 75 degrees at certain times of day and all that good stuff. I would think with all those vacant buildings or, or buildings not in use, there would be, um, you know, a power increase, if you will. Mm -hmm. as a result. Do you, are you seeing that at all or is that just a, an anomaly? So in terms of overall power usage, we've seen a, a slight dip downwards, uh, definitely from the commercial sector uh, that's beginning. That trend is beginning to reverse a little bit as more and more businesses open. But where we, we saw the increase, obviously, is people working from home. So we've provided a number of tips through our website to make sure that those homeowners don't see a massive bill that, that comes and it's a bit overwhelming for them, uh, allow them to better budget for those. Um, so that's what we're doing on, in, in terms of managing budgets. I, I actually don't know the answer to your question about the advice we're giving commercial, uh, the commercial side of the house about um, energy efficiency and energy conservation, but I'd be happy to, to research that and get back to you. No, I was just curious, because I know like, the, you know, the building I used to work in is basically vacant. I mean, it's, it's, you know, and it's, it's a 10 story building in, in Santa Ana. And I know um, people go in there occasionally, but I was just kind of curious on how that worked. Also, what about um, people with, with solar power on their roofs and the um, fact that they think that they're off the grid? and they won't have outages. Can you speak a little bit about that? So the, it depends on the type of outages. If, um, you know, one of the, the things that happened in the last month is we had, uh, we had the warnings of rolling outages, which was a result of what was happening with the grid well beyond Edison. It was the entire Western US. And, and those, those warnings went out. And this does speak also to the, the commercial building side. What happened was is we issued um, uh, demand reduction. We have these demand reduction programs where companies and also residents volunteer to get a discount on their bills by participating. And it allows us to essentially lower their, their power usage so that we make sure that none of our circuits go offline. Um, and that's one way that we, we manage those. For people that, that have solar, they're part of, they're part of the grid. Um, they have generation at their home, but it doesn't prevent them from being uh, for there being power outages, because again, they're part of the grid and the way that Cal ISO, the, the, essentially the regulatory or governing body for, for the grid, they issue uh, outages for particular circuits, maybe a few per city across the entire service territory. So even if you have solar and you're part of one of those designated units that has to shut off this round, you, you can be impacted by an actual outage. Thankfully, the demand reduction program was really successful. So despite all of the warnings and um, that your power was about to go out, it didn't actually go out, but there, were, there was such an incredible demand um, on the system that we had a number of transformers blow across our service territory. So the warnings were that we're gonna shut off your power, but then actual damage to the equipment happened because we were revving it so high. So it gets a bit confusing for the customer knowing what actually led to their power being turned off. Okay, that's all I had, thank you. Okay, thank you. It, does anyone else have a question? Okay, thank you, Mr. Peterson. Thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. Okay, now we're going to move on uh, to a presentation for Fire Prevention Week, or proclamation, sorry. The City of Seal Beach is recognizing Serve Up Fire Safety in the Kitchen as Fire Prevention Week it comes October 4th through the 10th. Fire is a serious public safety concern, both locally and nationally, and homes are where people are at greatest risk from fire. Cooking is the leading cause of home fires in the United States where fire departments responded to more than 173,200 annually between 2013 and 2017. And two out of every home fire start in the kitchen, 31% of these fires resulting from unattended cooking. Please stay in the kitchen when food, frying food on the stovetop. 
keep a three foot kid free zone around the areas and keep anything that can catch fire away from stovetops. Orange County residents, please stay alert and use caution when cooking to reduce the risk of kitchen fires. Now I'd like to call upon Chief Ron Roberts, please. Good evening, Madam Mayor and City Council, City staff. Uh, the Orange County Fire Authority, we say thank you for this proclamation. Uh, this is a very important week to us and I appreciate the recognition very much and we look forward to working with the city and the residents throughout the rest of the year. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for all you do. Okay, I'd like to uh, move on to oral communications. Pursuant to the Brown Act, the council cannot discuss or take action on any item not on the agenda unless authorized by law. No other business shall be considered. All email comments the city clerk received before the start of the meeting were distributed to the city council and made available to the public on the city's website. Email comments received after the start of the meeting will be forwarded to the city council after the meeting. City clerk, do we have any emailed comments? Yes, Mayor, we received one email comment. It has been distributed to the council and made available to the public on the city's website. Okay, thank you very much. We'll move on to city attorney report. City attorney Steele, do you have anything to report tonight? Council close portable. So we're not hearing we're not hearing you very steady. Attorney Attorney Steele, could you repeat that please? I I couldn't hear that. Mayor, if I could, I could just um, state um, for the city attorney that the council met in closed session regarding the closed session items that were posted on the agenda and the council took no reportable action. Okay, thank you very much. We'll move on to city manager report. City manager Ingram, do you have anything to report? Yes, thank you, Mayor. I have two items tonight. First, I'd like to report that the city um, will be reopening our cooling centers this week as a result of the predicted heat wave. Starting tomorrow, Tuesday, September 29th, and Wednesday, September 30th, the Marina Community Center and Seal Beach Tennis Center will both be open from 11 a.m. to 6 p.m. with air conditioning, water, and table, tables and chairs available. Please note that social distancing and face coverings will be required while inside our cooling centers. Second, I would like to ask Les Johnson, our Community Development Director, to briefly highlight the Hold Fast Seal Beach marketing campaign efforts that he is leading with Deb Matchin of Market Snag, a local marketing small business owner, to promote local Seal Beach businesses over the next six months. Les will also be sharing the new marketing campaign video tonight that was recently launched as part of this effort as well. Les? Uh, thank you, City Manager Ingram. Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, and City Council. Uh, when staff presented the communal dining idea to City Council back in June, the proposal included a business marketing campaign. A budget of 30,000 was identified, and it was also noted that staff would attempt to utilize a local consultant to assist with this campaign. Market Snag was selected in July for this effort. Uh, Market Snag is a local marketing promotion firm located here in Seal Beach that is owned by Deb Match. Next slide. The objective uh, of this effort is to promote our local businesses during the COVID-19 pandemic. We want our local residents and those in the region to know that Seal Beach businesses are staying the course during this unprecedented time and are open and ready to serve our customers. Next slide. Uh, the scope of the program uh, includes uh, a number of key items. First, uh, uh, creating a logo and slogan that supports our local businesses while representing the times we're currently enduring. Establishing easily identifiable signage, including banners and posters. 
creating a web page on the city's website and also creating a social media presence using Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Developing contests that encourage visiting local businesses, strategically advertising in our local and regional markets, primarily focusing upon the greater Seal Beach area and those living within about a 15 to 20 minute drive of Seal Beach. Creating at least one video promoting uh, our businesses during this time and within that video representing the safe and inviting environment that has been created by our local businesses and creating an email marketing campaign that reaches out to several thousand residents and visitors. Next slide. With regards to the current status, uh, uh, the marketing campaign was launched just about three weeks ago. Uh, the Hold Fast slogan and logo was created. And again, the Hold Fast is a nautical term that is intended to uh, really focus in on staying the course and enduring uh, the condition at hand. Uh, you may have also seen uh, a number of banners, signs and posters that have gone up throughout the community. We have 11 banners up, uh, some advertisement signs within uh, our uh, bus shelters, as well as uh, a few hundred posters that have been distributed out to businesses throughout the community. We now have a web page on the city's website exclusively for the Hold Fast Seal Beach campaign. And the social media pages and their presence is also now in place. A uh, contest was recently started where a weekly drawing for a $50 gift card occurs. Uh, the contest entries are based upon a person guessing the name of a Seal Beach business that's in a photo and the gift cards are being provided from local businesses. Advertisements uh, were placed in the local bus shelters, as I mentioned, and there's also additional ad advertisements to come out shortly, and, as well as a number of times throughout the campaign. The email marketing campaign was recently launched and an initial message was also sent out. And then the first video promoting local businesses has been created. And I wanted to briefly acknowledge Robin from Seal Beach TV for her assistance with this video production. And we'd like to show that to you at this time. I wanna feel the sun, have barbecues. I wanna see my friends, the old and new. We'll turn on the game and share some laughs. And we'll play this and that. And I'll say goodbye to rainy days, to the colder nights, and the empty trees. And I fall alive in colors new. And it's all here for you to see. Cloudless sky, summer days, feels just like it's some way. Kids are out, safe to play, and it feels just like a beautiful day. Cloudless sky, summer days, feels just like it's some way. Kids are out, safe to say, and it feels just like a beautiful day. A beautiful I wanna hear the birds as so they come and go And I'd love to fly if I had wings And I'd bring you with me I wanna hit the beach, the ocean air And we'll let the sand get everywhere We'll watch the sun as it melts away And I'll smile just the same
the sun, have barbecues. I wanna see my friends, the old and new. We'll turn on the game and share some laughs, and we'll play this and that. And I'll say goodbye to rainy days, to the colder nights and the empty trees. Now for the life. Here for you to see. Cloudless skies, summer days. Feels just like it's summer way. Kids are out, safe to play, and it feels just like a beautiful day. Cloudless skies, summer days. Feels just like it's summer way. Kids are out, safe to say, and it feels just like a beautiful day. A beautiful day. I wanna hear the birds as they come and go, and I love to fly. If I had wings, and I'd bring you with me. I wanna hit the beach, the ocean air. All right. Well, uh, thank you for your patience and going uh, through that. I, I do want to mention that it was lagging a little bit, and it would encourage you if you if you get an opportunity to. Uh, to go to the city's website, to the Hold Fast Seal Beach uh, page, and you can watch it there as well. Um, so our, as we switch over to the, uh, back to the PowerPoint here, um, a couple of additional items that I wanted to just mention to you. Uh, with regards to what's next, we, we, this, it doesn't end here, it, we're just beginning. And I wanted to mention it, that we will be uh, producing uh, additional advertising. You'll see much more advertising. Uh, you'll see some uh, additional banners, some new banners going up throughout the community uh, and signage over the next few months. Uh, and they may not always be the same. So our idea is to, uh, uh, to, to be eye-catching, creative and innovative as we continue to encourage people to, to shop Seal Beach. We're in the process of exploring options and opportunities to advertise uh, in local markets in close proximity to our community, uh, an effort to gain their attention, and uh, especially those that are live within a short distance of our community. Uh, there'll be additional contests over the next few months uh, uh, that continue to promote our local businesses, so stay tuned for those. Uh, we're also looking into one or possibly even two more marketing videos being created as we want to capture uh, the changing environment and the, the positive changing environment within our business community. Uh, and we're going to uh, continue to develop and utilize the email marketing uh, campaign. Uh, and this is, a, again, an effort that is not a, uh, limited to the, just right now at this moment. This is one that will continue for the next few months, uh, at least until the end of this year, and possibly even a month or so into next year. Uh, and next slide, please. And finally, uh, I just want to remind everyone to continue to hold fast and stay the course. We're going to get through this. Uh, please continue to show your support for our local businesses. This has been such a challenging time for so many of our businesses. And in fact, uh, maybe it's a little early for this, but consider doing as much of your uh, shopping locally as possible, especially during the upcoming holidays. And then also, uh, most of our businesses are now back open and ready to serve you when you are ready. So with that, that concludes my presentation. Uh, this evening, and I'll turn it back over to City Manager Ingram. Thank you, Les. Uh, Mayor, if there's any questions of Les regarding our Hold Fast Seal Beach marketing <laughs> campaign, um, you'd be happy to address those now if, if you'd like. Okay. D uh, did any of this council members have questions uh, for Les? Okay. Well, thank Great. you very much. Yeah, great. Thank you very much, Council, and that concludes my report tonight. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we'll move on to uh, Council Member comments now. Uh, Council Member Moore, did you have any comments tonight? Yes, thank you, Mayor. I'd just like to thank Southern California Edison for the update tonight. Um, I attended an OCFA meeting last week where they announced the new CH47 hilly tanker that will be 
able to drop 3,000 gallons of water uh, to help out with the wildfires. <clears throat> the very large heli tanker uh, is a 83-day partnership with Southern California Edison, Colson Aviation, and the Orange County Fire Authority. And it will enhance aerial wildland fire response in Orange County and the residents and businesses within the SCE service territory. And it will be available for daytime and nighttime firefighting. And the service is anticipated to commence on October 1st. Um, I'd like to thank the marketing effort for Hold Fast. Uh, I think it's been very well done so far. I've seen the marketing on Facebook and other areas, and I also appreciate the video that we just watched. It was very well done. Um, I'd like to thank Public Works and the Parks and Rec staff for getting started on our new fence in Edison Park. It looks great. And finally, I'd like to thank a resident in Leisure World who suggested uh, putting some bins for used fishing lines on the pier. Uh, the city manager and staff are looking into some solutions for that, similar to what Newport Beach does already on their pier. And that's all I have. Thanks. Okay. Uh, Council Member Fair Papa, do you have any a report tonight? Yes, thank you. Um, I just wanted to state that I did uh, get a, a lot of neg or, um, positive comments regarding the um, outdoor parking and eating uh, parklets. Um, many residents last weekend were um, in favor of what they've seen and they really like, you know, everything that's going on out there. And I really want to say um, thanks to Les and all the staff for doing such a great job out there. It looks so nice. And even at, at night, it looks nice all lit up. And I just wanted to state that even though Los Al High School is starting tomorrow, the um, McGaw Elementary School started last week. And I kind of wanted to acknowledge the crossing guards and all the people that are working around the school and just, you know, be wary of them and, 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 and you know, give them a wave and be cautious when you're driving around Bolsa and, and, and all these streets where the school crossing guards are. They do a great job for us. And I wanted to thank the uh, Public Works for the new markings they put around the school. I know they're not done yet, but the things they've done so far look really good. So thank you for that and uh, keep up the good work. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Council Member Masalavit, did you have a report? Yes, um, I attended the uh, uh, Orange County Sanitation District meeting. Um, they continue to monitor our waste, and make sure that we're not contaminating anything and they've managed to be clean um, in terms of contagion. Um, also, <clears throat> there, there are a lot of construction projects ongoing with the sanitation district. It is a huge agency. Um, and uh, they want you to know that for whatever they can purchase in Orange County, uh, they do for their projects and they are doing their best to keep the economy going. Uh, the other agency I attended uh, is Vector Control, and you know, here I go, about mosquitoes. Uh, it really is an um, active year for mosquitoes. Many people are getting bit and bitten, and um, it, uh, you just need to take care of your environment, make sure there isn't any standing water, I know in Leisure World, um, I was able to contact our um, uh, public works department who contacted flood control and was able to get some of the flood control channel in Leisure World cleaned out. I noticed that the other day. And uh, hopefully uh, with the active spraying that Vector does, that will control most of those mosquitoes. Uh, so be careful, beware, West Nile virus is very much with us. So you need to be really, really careful. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Kalmick, did you have a report? Yes, uh, thank you, Mayor. 
Um, I'd like to bring up one item tonight um, for an agenda item to be discussed at a date in the future, uh, not at a specific time at the moment. As we've noticed, um, our list of CIP projects keeps growing as our infrastructure keeps aging and other emergencies, you know, crop up. Um, I, I really want to commend our city staff for trying to stay ahead of these things and and keep our planning um, further out in a sense than just the five years in our five year CIP. What I'd like to have a discussion about um, sooner than later would be the possibility of at some point in the future, the construction of a parking structure um, adjacent to the fire station on Central and the possibility of combining that with a project involving the fire station. The fire station 44 is uh, very old. It's uh, way out of compliance with regard to everything from ADA to uh, co-ed um, you know, facilities. And it might be a good time just to start looking into the future, getting some ballpark figures in terms of um, number one, would a parking structure be something that we should be looking at based on the parking situation downtown? Um, it could potentially solve a lot of those problems. And if it was built at the same time, possibly uh, as a fire station in one larger project, you could reconfigure for better use the entire block, that whole corner. So I'm requesting um, that item to be agendized and uh, we can uh, discuss at what point it would be, um, you know, uh, staff would have the time to give us some ideas and uh, potential costs. And that's what I have for this evening. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, for my report tonight, I uh, have been doing my usual mayor, weekly mayor's calls. I do three of them uh, with different different sets of mayor, different sets of people each week. Uh, uh, thank you to Public Works for sitting down, having a meeting uh, with me, talking about upcoming projects, and for uh, Rob Jenke with the Chamber for uh, sitting down and discussing uh, how things are going with the, uh, on Main Street, basically. Um, I watched a, a seminar uh, uh, sponsored by uh, Senator Tom Umberg tonight on Protect the Vote. Uh, participating in that were Secretary, California Secretary of State Alex Padilla and uh, Orange County Register Voters, um, head of that, uh, Neil Kelly, and, and they went through all the steps that uh, keep, keep the vote in Orange County safe. Um, uh, yesterday, uh, or maybe it was Sunday, I'm trying to, re well, yesterday was Sunday, uh, a mask video was released. Uh, this was something that the one of the uh, Orange County Mayor's groups um, um, sent, um, Santa Ana Mayor Polito uh, started. Um, they decided that they wanted to make a, a video that would promote mask usage. And so all the 34 mayors in, in Orange County uh, got together. Uh, and this was uh, Orange County High School of the Arts deci uh, decided that they would help uh, produce this. And so it was just released and it's going to be put on uh, cable and in local TV3 stations uh, to try to, you know, it, it, it helps promote Orange County and a lot of different sites around there, but also reminds people to please wear a mask and help everyone stay safe. So thank you. That's all I have tonight. Okay. City Clerk Harper, did we have the um, the video to, to show tonight? The video is coming right up. Oh, Perfect. It's thank ready. you. Okay, thank you.
Right now, across Orange County, you are needed. Right now, the call goes out for you to step up and help your neighbor. From the beaches to the city, we all play a part in protecting each other. Wearing your mask is a simple way to show your family, your friends, your community that you care. Because when you keep the safety of others in mind, it inspires them to think of you too. So please, take a mask with you when you're out and about, and remember to stay at least six feet apart from others. When we do our part, we help prevent the spread of coronavirus. When we do our part, we spread a movement of collective consideration for our community. Right now, right now, right now, it's time to come together as one and work together to build a better tomorrow. When we work together, we are stronger. We need each other like no other time in history. Right now, it's time to stand together. We need you. We need you. We need you to stand up, put on your mask, and tell your neighbor, I've got you. I've got you. I've got you. And no matter how tough it gets, we will come back stronger because we did it together. together. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much for that. Um, okay, we will then move on to, uh, we have no council items, we'll move on to the consent calendar. Items on the consent calendar are considered to be routine and are enacted by a single motion with the exception of items removed by council members. Okay, we have no items removed, so I'd like to call for a motion to approve the consent calendar. Motion to approve. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Uh, Clerk Harper, could you please call for the vote by roll call, please? Yes. Mayor Sestarsik, how do you vote? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Kalmik, how do you vote? Yes. Council Member Verapapa, how do you vote? Yes. Council Member Moore, how do you vote? Yes. Council Member Masawalad, how do you vote? Yes. Okay, that passes 5-0. Thank you very much. Uh, we have no public hearings tonight. We're going to move on to unfinished continued business. <laughs> Item H, a resolution of the Seal Beach City Council approving amendment number one to the agreement with Consolidated Disposal Service LLC for an adjustment in the residential green waste recycling rate authorizing allocating funds to Compensate Republic Services for processing green waste and approving amending the existing scope of work with HF and H and authorizing the city manager to execute necessary documents on behalf of the city. Uh, I'd like to call upon Assistant City Manager Gallegos, please. Uh, good evening, Mayor and members of the City Council. Um, before I begin, I want to uh, let you know that we also have Republic Services General Manager Chris Kentop and Municipal Relations Manager Manuel Gavea on the line. Uh, they're available to answer any questions after the presentation. Uh, Manuel, or Manny as most of us know him, as, uh, is also the Vice President of the Silvius Chamber of Commerce. Uh, first, let me mention one thing. Um, staff rescinded its recommendation to amend the scope of work with HFNH tonight, which is item number four on the summary of your request on the, on the staff report. Uh, we'll be bringing this item back to council on October 12th uh, for your consideration. Let's talk about what is actually being requested tonight. So Assembly Bill 1594, uh, this is yet another state unfunded mandate. I can't stress that enough. It's, it is the state that is mandating this action and the city is required to act as a result. So let me give you some background on AB 1594. The California State Legislature enacted Assembly Bill 1594 mandating that as of January 1st, 2020, the use of green materials alternative daily cover, otherwise known as ADC, at landfills would no longer constitute diversion through recycling and would instead be considered disposal for purposes of measuring a jurisdiction's annual 50% per capita disposal rate. As you know, jurisdictions in California are required to meet this 50% diversion goal as part of Assembly Bill 939, another state unfunded mandate that has been in place for a couple of decades. AB 1594 was designed to require recycling of green waste and help improve air quality by reducing greenhouse gas emissions that are produced in landfills when, when organic materials such as green waste decomposes. Historically, Republic Services delivered green waste collected from the city customers to the Orange County Landfill System for use as ADC. The Orange County Landfill System traditionally accepted the green waste for use as ADC at no charge to customers. But given the enactment of AB 1594, this is no longer the best option. Consequently, the city determined that the, with the elimination of diversion credit for ADC, 
as outlined by AB 1594, and the negative impact this will have on the city's state calculated diversion rate, an alternative destination for processing the city's green waste was necessary. If the proposed amendment is approved, uh, Republic Services will transfer the city's future green waste to the land application operation, also known as the Circle Green Operations located in the city of El Mirage. Subsequent to pre-processing the material at Republic Services Rainbow Environmental Facility located in the city of Huntington Beach. The city will have the right, if so desired, to choose another location for the delivery of green waste. If the city directs that green waste to be delivered to another location, the rate paid by the rate payer, payer will be reduced or increased accordingly if the transportation and processing costs of using such facilities are lower or higher than the cost of using the circle green operation. To ensure the rates proposed by Republic Services to process the green waste were fair and reasonable, the city's solid waste consultant, HFNH, reviewed the rates and they were determined to be fair against other agency rates. Based on the final review by HFNH, staff is now recommending an AB 1594 compliance rate adjustment of 65 cents per residential and multifamily unit per month. In essence, residents and multifamily rates would increase by 65 cents per month, which would pay for the processing of the city's green waste and ensure that we are meeting the state's AB 1594 mandate. The proposed amendment only authorizes an adjustment to the residential and multifamily unit rate. There are no other changes to the collection agreement that will result if the amendment number one is approved. Since January, Republic has processed green waste under AB 1594, making certain the city is receiving diversion credit for this processing and, and not allowing the city's green waste to end up in a landfill. Staff directed Republic to start green waste processing as it was required by law and necessary to maintain the city's diversion credits while we attempted to come to terms on a new solid waste agreement with the hope of incorporating 1594 rates and the state's other unfunded legislative mandates, including AB 1826. Unfortunately, the pandemic spoiled and delayed staff strategy. However, it did not stop CalRecycle, the state agency that oversees solid waste and recycling, from insisting that city, cities implement the state's mandates or risk being in violation. As such, we now ask the council to allocate up to 34,000 to compensate Republic for processing green waste from January through September, utilizing Waste Management Act funds, which are restrictive funds designed to assist the city with implementing solid waste and recycling diversion goals. So you might ask yourself, what happens if the city doesn't approve AB 1594 rate adjustment tonight? Again, this is a state unfunded mandate. Not only would it make it more challenging, if not impossible, to maintain the city's 50% solid waste diversion requirement, the city would ultimately have to bear the cost of processing and diverting green waste to meet the 50% diversion requirement. Should that occur, CalRecycle Cal is authorized to impose fines to ensure that cities comply with the state's orders and the fines could be significant. Lastly, earlier today, we received a couple of questions from a community member who asked the following. Are yard clippings put in a brown slash gray trash cart separated out by Republic staff? Or is the city's green waste volume limited to that, to that put in a light green yard waste cart? The city's green waste volume is limited to what is put in a light yard waste cart by the residents, as Republic does not separate out yard waste from the trash cart. The existing contract does exempt specific res residential locations within the city from the Green Waste Collection Program, including Bridgeport, River Beach, and Old Town. However, Republic provides yard waste services to residents within these specific neighborhoods on a case-by-case -case basis upon request by the resident to meet their individual needs. The resident also noticed the detailed calculation sheet on the first page of attachment one, which shows that the new residential monthly rate, which includes an extra 65 cents charge will be $20.90. However, the very next page entitled Effective September 28, 2020 shows the monthly residential rate at 2035. I believe that's attachment uh, D. His question was which, which rate is the new rate including the green waste recycling charge? It appears the incorrect rate sheet was, was included within the agenda packet. The rate sheet included the current packet was created when this amendment was originally going to council back in March and we had updated it. Uh, the current rate sheet reflected the July CPI adjustment and the 65 cent increase for AB 1594 has been given to the city clerk and will replace the sheet that was distributed. The new rate sheet current, accurately reflects the $20.90 new rate as indicated on the sheet. Uh, the resident also asked, what is the discount eligibility criteria for senior citizens and low income households? 
Uh, qualifying senior citizens and low income households certified by the city, city shall be granted a 15% discount off residential rates. A senior citizen means a head of household over the age of 65 and low income means that they do not exceed the qualifying limits for lower income families established and amended by Section 8 of the U.S. Housing Act. With that, Chris uh, Kentop, the general manager, Manny, the municipal relation manager, and I would be able to answer any of your questions on the side. I had a quick question. Patrick? Yes, I'm here. The 65 cents, it, how long does that go for? I mean, is that um, every year it's going to go up? Every year it's going to stay the same? It's a five-year deal. How does that How does that work? It's it's a it's a one-time sixty-five cent, so it, it it doesn't necessarily increase. Okay. That's all I had. Thank you. Could we get a little background on what studies were done to determine this mandate was a good idea? You know, um, I can tell you that the, the basis of this started back uh, when AB 939 was implemented where um, there was a big push to divert uh, solid waste from the waste stream, basically to the landfill. And, in, and combined with that, uh, you had legislation throughout the last two decades, including Assembly Bill 1826, uh, the newest form, Senate Bill 1383, uh, and the one tonight that you're hearing about is Assembly Bill 1594. So there's a number of bills that are looking to reduce the amount of waste headed to the landfill. And there's a number of reasons for that. Um, one of the main ones is to reduce methane emissions, uh, as well as reducing the amount of trash at the landfill. So that's the genesis of, of a lot of these bills. and. Um, you know, maybe uh, Chris and or Manny uh, can can chime in and, and maybe talk to it on a, from a, a trash perspective. Are there, is there any scientific studies that prove this is a problem or that is cited in the legislation? Uh, there, there are plenty of studies uh, for certain. Now, there are obviously uh, uh, probably two sides to every coin, uh, but I will say the state has looked into it uh, from a science-based um, uh, uh, perception, um, and um, but I don't have those those scientific numbers in front of me, but I'd be more than happy to to send those to you uh, and get the retrieve those uh, from the uh, pertinent agencies. Okay, that's all I have right now. Okay, Did anybody else have a question? Um. I, I had a question for, I don't know, Patrick, whoever, are, aren't we supposed to be moving into a 75% diversion requirement soon? That is absolutely correct. Um, Senate Bill 1383. Um, uh, so there's a big push. And, and actually, Southern California is a little bit um, behind Northern California, uh, as we sometimes find ourselves in, in terms of recycling and solid waste. Uh, but there is a big push to to have the 75 percent uh diversion goal um uh, statewide and that's that's one of the reasons why you have a bill like ab 1826 which is really focused on uh, the recycling of food waste because you're having to find new ways in which to recycle um what used to be trash and does it once we get the organic recycling going and the green waste does it look like this will put us anywhere close to that or my understanding is that it is but um if i may allow uh, either chris or manny to speak on that sure. subject they can kind of give you a little bit more detail on that uh, Thank chris you. or manny sure are you muted <laughs> i think we're both waiting for the other to start oh, speaking yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this is chris uh, okay. uh, over at Republic, uh, thank you for uh, granting us uh, time this evening. Um, I think that uh, if I understand the question correctly, uh, will this get uh, the city yeah. closer to uh, complying with the new 
uh, Senate Bill 1383? And the answer is yes. Oh, good. Uh, that, uh, that legislation actually uh, requires an organics program, not just for uh, commercial businesses like 1826 does, but it's also going to actually add a food waste organic component to the residents. Um, in addition to that, it's got a lot of um, reporting requirements, auditing requirements, uh, a lot of uh, stipulations around the right type of container, branding, color. Um, it's a very, very extensive piece of legislation, and everybody is still trying to um, get their arms wrapped around it as it has not been either fully enacted or been through the rulemaking process. Um, but getting the businesses and the residents and everybody into compliance with 1826 and 1594 are going to be critical first steps from a uh, customer education and outreach standpoint to meeting the new mandates that are going to come down in 2022 for 1383. Uh, as Patrick uh, said, unfunded mandates, the, the, I think one of the biggest uh, critical delineators between 1594 1826 and 1383, the upcoming legislation, is that the penalties that are attached to non-compliance with 1383, um, which also um, includes uh, mandates from the state that local enforcement be enacted and ultimately if non-compliance is reached that there be a potential penalty phase for the city itself. So okay. it very, very cumbersome legislation, and these steps are, are critical uh, to, to making sure the city stays on the right side of the legislation as we move forward. Okay. My next question was, how soon would this start? And it sounds like sounds like 2022. That is correct. The rule oh. comes into effect 2022 with enforcement from the state starting in 2024. 2024. And the last time I spoke with you, we were thinking of ways that this might happen. Are we, are you any farther along on that? Are you still evaluating uh, methods and collection? And, uh, we are evaluating methods and, uh, you know, we're working through strategic partners to try to uh, lessen the burden. Uh -huh. um, it's either very, very capital intensive, requires very expensive equipment, or you need to come up with alternatives that, um, you know, allow other people's uh, investment to work for us and ultimately the city. Uh -huh. So we have preliminary, um, preliminary estimates on what the cost is going to be. What we're working on right now is ensuring that the compliance with auditing and other things are incorporated into those rates, and then we'll be looking to share them with uh, Patrick and Jill in the coming weeks and months. Uh, we definitely want to make sure that we have this in front of council so you're uh, informed early and often, but we want to make sure that we have our pencil you know, sharpened as it possibly can be before we actually uh, make a presentation to council. Okay, but the commercial, the commercial recycling, organic recycling is coming up first, that's correct? That is correct, and the reason for that is um, the uh, regulatory agency, CalRecycle, has actually uh, been making um, more direct requests that, you know, we help the city get into compliance with these programs in spite of the setbacks that the pandemic has created. Yeah. Um, and it will uh, go a long way towards alleviating uh, any potential compliance orders that come from CalRecycle to get this enacted. So okay. it is the very next thing on our agenda to address. Okay, okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, were there any other questions for anyone on this subject? I just had a quick question for Chris or Manny. Sure. sure. Um, just curious about the uh, life expectancy of the landfills that we are using and where where is the next one going to be on Mars or a little closer? Well I think um, from what I understand fortunately for the the residents in all of Orange County uh, there is ample airspace uh, which is the method that they measure the amount of space in the landfills uh, for the next 15 to 20 years. Oh, it's actually based on current generation models and not pulling out the organics or recycling this material that we're, we're discussing this evening. So, you know, scaling some of that back will potentially extend the life of the sites. Um, 
unfortunately, landfills are very, very uh, challenging to site and develop and build. So I would expect that they're going to be quite far away. Um, and while they may be cheaper to run the transportation to get the uh, material to those landfills is going to, the, the trucking costs are going to be uh, quite a bit more. So they're going to keep moving further and further out, I would assume, towards uh, the desert. Thank you. Okay, I had one more question in regards to that. Um, I Last time I was at the sanitation district, the second plant down uh, on PCH, they are starting a pilot project for organic uh, digestion, biogas kind of thing. If, if that kind of thing was developed, would that maybe be a closer alternative? Or I think they were talking about a tipping fee of $20, $25. So if it's more expensive, what, what would we just go with whatever's cheaper? Or what does, what does that possibility look like? Well, we are definitely, if, if there's a cheaper option, we're definitely going to explore it. My understanding of the request for information that was just published by the Orange County Sanitation District is for uh, what we would call digestate. Mm -hmm. So it's processed food waste that's added with water. Mm -hmm. So you wind up actually bulking up the finished product with liquid so they can process it. So okay. there's a lot of transportation costs and additional volume you have to dispose of because of all the water that needs to be added. Uh, okay. We currently work with a, a process that creates more of a cake type substance. Um, it is probably the consistency of oatmeal. And we use that with a green waste, food waste blend, compost it and reintroduce that to the environment as the form of a soil amendment. So we are actually in, in discussions with uh, Orange County Sanitation. We are gonna reply to the request for information. Um, but it requires a different processing equipment on the front end, an extensive amount of volume bulking and a lot of trucking costs to be attached to that. So you may potentially pay $30 on 100% more tons, which then doesn't make it so cost effective. The yeah. last thing that will ultimately happen to it is they'll have to create a receiving station for it. So instead of using garbage trucks or transfer trailers, you now have to come up with tanker trucks and pumps and things of that nature. So it's different but the yeah. same mm -hmm. and we're working with them to see how that would best uh, work with our, us and our, uh, our our cities like such as yourselves. Okay all right well <laughs> thank you very much just curious thank you very much. Um, okay did anyone else have any other questions? One more question. Okay. Um, and Tom? It was mentioned earlier that there are certain areas that don't have the green uh, trash can, Do, are they paying the increase? I guess they're ever. Is it for every resident, regardless of if they have the green trash bin? And then, if they don't have the green trash bin, why why don't they? I guess why why not have everyone do the green trash bin? Um, so the uh, first answer to that is yes. The 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 total cost of the program is being borne by all of the households, um, even though the uh, Greenway service is selectively not you know, used in some parts of the city. Unfortunately, both Manny and I uh, don't have the full history of the reason why those areas were excluded. Um, we do think that there are some parts of town that um, people may have smaller yards, the amount of volume that they actually are, are would generate would be a de minimis amount. And, and unfortunately, as I said, we really can't speak to why the contract was um, drafted that way, but in our discussions with Patrick and ultimately the consultant that was selected HF and H, these are things that we know that we need to address going forward. Um, I wish I can give you a clear answer on why those areas were excluded. I, I don't have that for you, but the, the program is uh, uh, you know, the rate of uh, adjustment would be applied towards all residents uh, within the city, excluding okay. the world. All right, thanks. Okay, uh, thank you. Are, are there any other questions? Okay, thank you very much for the presentation and for all the, uh, all the answers to the questions. Um, I'd like to now call for a motion to approve. 
Anyone like to make a motion? I'll move. Okay. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay. Just, City. Just for the record, Mayor, we're deleting sure. item. We're deleting item four from the proposed resolution. Okay. So we'll spin that into the motion then without uh, the item four. Uh, City Clerk Harper, could you take the vote by roll call, please? Yes. Mayor Sestarsik, how do you vote? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem, how do you vote? Uh, yes. Council Member Verapapa, how do you vote? Yes. Council Member Moore, how do you vote? Yes, but with reluctancy. <laughs> <laughs> Council Member Masalaban, how do you vote? I'll vote yes with concern. Okay, that passes 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 with some concern. Five zero, sort of. Okay, thank you very much. All right, we're going to move on to item I: five-year CIP discussion. Uh, City Manager Ingram, please. Yes, Mayor. Thank you. Um, before I turn this item over to Steve Miter and Kelly Telford, I wanted to provide some introductory context to this discussion item and ensure the council is clear on our goal for tonight's discussion prior to staff's presentation. If the council will, re re if the council will recall, during the fiscal year 2021 budget workshops in May and June, Staff presented a brief overview of the five-year CIP program to start the discussion regarding planning for CIP projects that staff believes will be necessary within the next five years. However, staff focused on the proposed one-year CIP budget and proposed projects for fiscal year 2021 as a result of two significant financial challenges. One of those challenges is the uncertainties of the ongoing impacts of COVID-19 and related closures on the city's revenues for fiscal year 1920 and fiscal year 2021. The second challenge is the substantial cost of proposed projects in the five-year CIP program. As a result, at the conclusion of the fiscal year 2021 budget workshops, staff indicated that we would come back to the council within a few months to further discuss the five-year CIP program and propose future projects and seek direction. With respect to two of those projects, the Lifeguard Headquarters PD substation and Tennis Center Locker Room Gym projects, the Council adopted the fiscal year 2021 annual budget with only the one-year proposed CIP projects, including design expenditures for both of these projects, with staff's commitment that we would not move forward with those two project design expenditures until the Council and staff had a more in-depth discussion of the five-year CIP program and receive direction from the council, which is why we're here tonight. However, having said that, our staff team has spent a significant amount of time over the past few months discussing these projects and related financial costs in much greater detail with the project teams in preparation for tonight's discussion. And as a result, Tonight, staff is not requesting any action or direction from the council with respect to the five-year CIP program. Our goal for tonight is to present and discuss five high-priority projects within the five-year CIP program and for the council to have a good grasp of those proposed projects and why staff believes they are necessary to start planning for now as well as the financial challenges and potential financing options, and for the council to have more time to digest this updated information. Those five projects include the Tennis Center Locker Room Gym Project, Peer Improvement Projects, Main Street Improvement Program, Lifeguard Headquarters PD Substation Project, and the Community Pool Project. Staff's recommendation tonight following the presentation and discussion is for the council and staff to facilitate more in-depth discussions of these projects and financial challenges at the next strategic planning meeting, which we anticipate will be held after the first of the year and which we hope will be safe at that time to hold in a regular meeting format 
so that the public can attend and participate and provide input and comments on these projects in planning for the fiscal year 21-22 annual budget process and our community's future. At that time, we are confident the council will be fully prepared with much more information and detail on these projects and providing direction to staff so that we can then move forward with the five-year CIP program. Finally, I also wanted to thank Dustin Alamo, Vice President and Certified Construction Manager with Griffin Structures for being available to assist staff on our Zoom meeting tonight for this presentation. Griffin Structures updated our 2017 facility needs assessment, so they're very familiar with all of our facilities. And additionally, Dustin has been an integral part of the project teams for the Lifeguard Headquarters PD substation project as well as the community pool project, especially with respect to project cost estimates. So at this point, I will turn the presentation over to Steve Miter and Kelly Telford. Thank you, City Manager Ingram. Tonight's presentation, uh, next slide please. Tonight's presentation builds on the five-year capital improvement program presentation that was initially given as a part of the fiscal year 2021 budget presentation this past May. The main focus of tonight's presentation is to pro provide an opportunity for a more in-depth discussion regarding future CIP projects funded by the general fund. We will discuss the available balances in the general fund reserves, review the CIP needs over the next five years, as well as projects that are further out than that, and finally, Public Works Director Steve Miter will review five specific proposed capital projects in more detail, all of which are being funded directly or indirectly by the general fund. Next slide, please. I wanna to start tonight's discussion with a review of the general fund's available balances. As we completed the budget development process this past spring, we began having deeper conversations about certain projects that were going to become a higher priority in the near future, but also came with high price tags. Here you can see that we anticipate having a healthy fund balance as of June 30th, 2020. But this also highlights one key budget development issue. The city of Seal Beach has always budgeted CIP out of reserves rather than using that year's revenue. This may be a little confusing, so let me break it down just a little bit simpler. Most organizations calculate a balanced budget as revenues minus operating costs minus capital costs equals zero. This means that they are never using reserves in a budget cycle unless there is an economic downturn or other unusual reason to utilize it. For the city of Seal Beach, when we talk about a balanced budget, we talk about revenues minus operating costs equaling zero. All CIP budget, uh, budgeted projects come from fund balance reserves and over the years, the majority of the fund balance has been used. As of June 30th, 2020, fund balance in the general fund is expected to end near 22.7 million, which is an increase of 4.3 million from the previous fiscal year. However, this is mostly due to the receipt of insurance settlements related to the Pier Restaurant fire and the first reimbursement from the insurance company for the repair of the Pier fire, or the repair of the Pier from the fire. The settlement has been earmarked until a plan is made of what to do with this space in the future. The remaining increase is a timing delay related to capital improvement projects that were appropriated in prior years, but have not been either started or not been completed. And we do expect this to be sent down in the current year. In this slide, you can see that I've listed all of the commitments that the city council has enacted in the past, including the fiscal policy, the economic contingency reserve, the swimming pool project, and all of the other miscellaneous items such as encumbrances and compensated absences. At, towards the bottom, I have also included the budgeted amount for fiscal year 21, 2021 CIP to be transferred from the general fund because we also expect the majority of those to be spent this year. At the end of the day, this leaves us with a little over $2 million in unassigned fund balance to spend on future projects or increases in operating costs. We will have challenges funding CIP projects into the future unless we begin incorporating them into the annual budget using that year's reserves or unless we obtain outside financing, which we can only afford so much. Next slide, please. 
This slide shows the funding needs for the projects listed in the five-year CIP. It should, also, it should be noted that the Tidelands Fund is subsidized by the general fund. So the project costs listed here will likely come from general fund dollars. The remaining funding source, sources shown here are considered restricted funds. Currently, the five-year CIP program needs approximately 17 million in general fund dollars to pay for all of the projects that are listed. And the five-year CIP currently does not include costs for the pool project. Next slide. In addition to the projects listed in the five-year, there are other projects that are currently being assessed and will likely come at the tail end of the five years. Currently, these projects do not qualify for any of our restricted funding sources. As these projects get closer, we will be looking at grant opportunities for projects such as the storm drain and parks projects. However, without grant funding, these will need to be funded with general fund monies. And now I'm gonna turn the presentation over to Steve Miter, our public works director, to discuss the specific projects in more detail. Thank you, uh, Finance Director uh, Telford. Uh, these next slides will uh, focus in on five projects and we'll go to the next slide, please. Uh, before I, but first, I'd like to go, just give an overview of a five-year CIP program and what the goals are. The first, the first fiscal year of any five-year capital improvement program sets priorities and appropriates funds which are incorporated into the city's annual budget. The remaining four capital improvement program provides, the remaining four years of the capital improvement program provides a basis for project planning and coordination to develop, construct, and maintain public improvements, address significant maintenance and upgrade needs, respond to changing legislation, conditions, and priorities. The main takeaway is that the out years of the five-year program, five FY21 through FY25, are projections are subject to change based on changing priorities and infrastructure needs. Next slide. This next, this next set of slides will focus in on the tennis center, locker room, and gym. Um, I, I'll first I'll summarize the building itself, constructed in the 70s, approximately 3,200 square feet. It, um, it consists of uh, men's, and re men's and women's restrooms, showers, locker rooms, and a co-ed gym, which was actually converted from an atrium back in 2015. Sauna and spas are no longer operational, and a new, a new roof was installed in 2019. And while completing this roof for the building uh, earlier this year, it was discovered that the tennis center locker room, men's and women's showers housed in alcove structures attached to the east and west side of the main building had extensive wood rot throughout the exterior walls and underlying roof structure. Upon further evaluation of the structure, it was determined that a full reconstruction of the alcoves would be required to restore the restroom showers. This project reconstructs the alcove, the shower alcoves, as well as completes renovations, as, as well as completes the renovation of two restrooms, locker rooms, and brings them up to ADA current codes. Next slide. This aerial shows the overall footprint of the locker room building. The alcoves that house both the men's and women's showers are highlighted in yellow. And it is these structures that would be reconstructed to restore the showers. Next slide. This shows um, the east elevation as it is today. As you can see the alcoves or the enclosure, those are actually, the showers are actually housed in those. Um, and they're wrapped in plastic. Uh, because they're not really, we couldn't reconstruct them and there didn't make a lot of sense to put plywood on, so we just wrapped them in plastic. The west side elevation, uh, some of the, the siding itself was rotted, so we had to replace, we had to remove that to get the new roof on. And of course the alcove, you can see that wrapped in plastic too. So we have the building is sealed weatherproof by, by plastic. So we're just, and it, we're, we're, it's pretty much uh, protected from the elements at this point, but of course we need to rebuild it. Uh, the, the lower picture is actually of the interior and it shows how the showers have been closed off from the inside. That's how it looks right now. Next slide. So option one renovates the showers and the building, reconstructs the shower enclosures. Those are the alcoves we were talking about. Major restroom renovations of the restrooms, 
general renovations of the uh, overall building itself. It installs new siding on the west side, properly abandoned spa, sauna and spa. Total project cost 650,000. Option two, remove the shower, showers, remove the shower enclosure of the alcoves, um, and just, just do not have showers anymore. So what you would do then is you would take the building sides and rebuild them without those alcoves and properly abandon the spa and sauna and provide some minor building renovations and this could be accomplished for about $100,000. Next slide. To be conservative, option one, replacement of the showers and general building renovations has been incorporated into the city's five-year capital improvement program as part of the FY 2021 adopted budget. The option one project is estimated at a cost of $650,000 with $60,000 allocated for this fiscal year for the design phase. The project construction cost is planned for FY 21-22 at an estimated cost of 590,000. Should option two be selected, uh, which does not replace the showers, it, and it does not replace the showers and removes the alcoves, the overall project cost would be reduced to $100,000. Next slide. Okay, the, um, this next set of slides will focus in on the pure abutment improvements. So the pier abutment, um, it's a concrete, a concrete a restoration contractor inspected the pier base or the abutment, which you can see. When I talk about the pier abutment, if you look at your lower right-hand slide, that's kind of a picture of the concrete structure. That's the wood. So the wood portion of the pier meets this concrete structure, and obviously it takes it on into uh, Ocean Avenue, Ocean Boulevard. Um, so uh, this, it's an 80-year, 80 80-year 80 plus structure, and it is in need of, uh, reinfor of surface repairs and reinforcing to ensure the pier is base integrity well into the future. Next slide. This just gives a, this aerial shows the concrete pier abutment project area outlined in red and highlighted in yellow. The project area includes the vertical walls, columns, and concrete pier deck, and the ramps. Next slide. This picture, these pictures here show um, just the various uh, cracking and um, sprawling of concrete. I show the uh, upper left picture. I actually, I placed that in there. For those of you who remember, this is where the uh, wood deck joins the concrete structure. And at each corner, there used to be, uh, used to be lights there. And those lights were removed to be restored. And we went back to put them back up. The concrete was so far deteriorated at these corners, we could not safely put them and install them. So the those corners will have to be rehabilitated and we can't put the lights up until uh, we do that. And these other pictures are just various pictures of the sprawling. What's happening is the concrete, moi the, the moist corrosive marine environment uh, over the years penetrates into the uh, surface of the uh, concrete and starts arresting the, uh, the actual structural steel underneath the concrete. So it starts popping, it starts cracking. And, the more it cracks, of course, the more steel gets exposed and the more it cracks again. So this is something that will keep continue to expand unless it's sealed off. Next slide. So the, the, um, the concrete pier restoration scope of work, in summary, it's, it's taking epoxy and sealing all the cracks to protect the steel underneath and then apply a epoxy coating over the, all the concrete surfaces to seal them from the marine environment, thus extending the life of the structure. The overall project is estimated at $400,000 and is planned for FY 21-22. Next slide. So the proposed pier abutment project is shown on this table highlighted in blue, which staff believes is the highest Thailand's funded project. However, there are other important Thailand funded projects shown on this table in the vicinity of the pier base contained in the five-year CIP that should be funded within the next five years, such as the uh, pier restroom restoration, 8th Street, 10th Street lot re rehabilitation, uh, beach planter ring replacement, and an ADA ramp from, from the um, park down to 10th Street. Uh, it's 10th Street parking lot. Next slide. 
Uh, this next set of slides will focus on Main Street improvement. Uh, this pro can you back up, please? Thank you. Uh, this project utilizes a multi-phased approach to develop potential designs to replace the aging infrastructure within the Main Street corridor and develop concept designs to enhance the existing Main Street corridor streetscape. The goal is to build on the existing streetscape design elements within the corridor and create an overarching concept design that would tie the 100, 200, and 300 blocks together with a uniform design theme that could be utilized to schedule future Main Street improvement projects as funding becomes available while ensuring consistency. Next slide. So status phase one development of the concept design kicked off last fall in 2000, fall 2019 with the, with the appointment of a design steering committee that was comprised of council members, city staff, community business leaders, and also uh, members of the chamber members of the Chamber of Commerce and led by, the, um, led by the design consulting team with the goal of establishing the basis of the design criteria upon which the concept design could be further developed and presented to the public outreach meetings for future input, further input. The steering committee was able to meet twice before COVID-19 Safer at Home order was issued and the work had to be suspended. Next slide. Next slide. So the plan for FY 2021 is to complete phase one, the concept design, once public meetings can resume. Phase two, engineering and design, and phase three, construction of the proposed infrastructure based on the final concept design is planned to commence starting in FY 2122. Next slide. This, this, this table shows the project is, is currently budgeted within the C, uh, city's five-year CIP improvement program. As you can see, the to, uh, it's been it's showing, phased, showing a phased approach and the total cost is estimated at $1.9 million over the, over the course of five years. Next slide. The current lifeguard headquarters in PD substation building and support structures were initially constructed many decades ago and have, have undergone through, have gone through numerous modifications over the years, but the last major modification completed sometime in the late 90s. Over the past five years, the structure have, structures have required significant repairs due to their overall age and the fact that they apparently were not constructed to typical building standards, including no consideration given to ADA requirements. As such, the required maintenance to keep these structures and services is anticipated to become more complex and expensive. Moreover, the recently completed needs assessment shows the overall facility no longer serves the operational needs of the Marine Safety Division or the uh, Police Department. Uh, next slide. The, um, the needs assessment was completed in FY 2000. 19, uh, 2020. This, uh, this type of analysis is typical, typically the first step in planning a major facility renovation replacement. The needs assessment was restricted to the uh, current lifeguard limits as, as outlined in red in the two existing structures located within these limits. A complete evaluation of the existing facility and how the current buildings are utilized by the departments were uh, when conducting their operations was performed. From this evaluation, the required facility, facility square footage was calculated based on current operational considerations. Once the space requirements for the various departmental functions was established, a total of four options was developed and evaluated. The first option was to evaluate the feasibility of doing a major renovation of the existing buildings util utilizing as much as the existing structures as possible to still meet the department's operational needs. Operations options two and four were based on demolition of the existing buildings and constructing a new structure that would meet all the department operational needs as well as to account for the building site, the building site's unique design challenges and regulatory requirements. Next slide. 
At the conclusion of this assessment, it was determined that option four would serve the department's operational needs while providing some sufficient flexibility in design layout to meet unique design constraints and uh, regulatory requirements. Option one was evaluated. However, it, based on what we, um, however, based on the uh, overall challenges of the site and the overall needs, it was that it was not likely to uh, be able to serve, um, not likely to be approved by regulatory agencies. So therefore it was no longer considered. So we're gonna be presenting option four tonight, the floor plan for option four, which was determined to best meet both the Marine Safety Department and Police Department operational needs as, as well as to provide the needed flexibility for the site parameters. Next. So what we're seeing here is you're, we're showing the outline of the proposed uh, layout of option four at the parking lot level. And this, this, and you can see the uh, red dashed lines, that's the existing footprint of the two structures. So it gives you kind of a little more orientation. So next slide, please. So this is the same option four layout. We're now at the uh, pier level or the street level. And this is uh, the actual substation uh, level as well. And this shows you the kind of the, uh, the proposed layout. And the, um, what you're seeing off to the uh, left is the actual roof of the first level. So one of the parameters, one of the requirements was not to affect the view corridor. So you're seeing pretty much the same view corridor you would see now with the new structure. Next slide. And of course, this is the uh, lifeguard uh, tower that's on top. And it, it, you can see the uh, tower outline as it is today in red dash line, and this would be the proposed new tower. Of course, it's larger, so we can accommodate stairs, or we can accommodate more, more um, so we can accommodate the stairs itself. Next slide. So this slide essentially summarizes that the existing building uh, was not able to meet their needs in the space and we're actually increasing the new building would increase the square footage to to enhance circulation and, and meet their needs meet the department's needs um of course there of course this is such a high level uh design layout that assumptions had to be made and these are the assumptions that were made for the design itself next slide this table shows Estimated project costs for both option one, which renovates the existing structure, and option two, which is demolition of the existing structure and constructing in a new building. So the, the changes, the major drawbacks with uh, the gutting and renovation of this facility are that in the uh, end, the newly renovated facility would not meet current operational needs and is, is unlikely to meet the requirements of uh, regulatory requirements. Therefore, option four was incorporated into the five-year capital program constructing option four project will ensure the new building meets departmental operational needs as well as provide sufficient flexibility for permitting and unique challenges. At this point, um, I'd like to ask Dustin, who is the, uh, who is the project manager of this, Maybe he can give some insight to how these numbers were developed and what went into them. Dustin, can you, uh, are you able to join us? I sure am. Good evening. Yeah, please. Yeah, and uh, also there's a, there's a cost estimate slide for the pool, which he obviously was, uh, led, led in as well. So I'd like him to take us, take us through how these are put together. Uh, go ahead and tell us the, the uh, process that goes into it. Sure. And I think you hit the nail on the head in, in regards to option one being um, challenged in many ways relative to uh, not meeting the, the current program. Um, that, that's the biggest reason, of course, but it is a, a very old building and there's some challenge and unknowns when you go into a renovation scenario. But nonetheless, um, we have developed the two options and put the, the budgets uh, to each of those. Uh, the largest component of the budget is the construction line. Um, and you can see that on each option, 3.4 on option one and 7.1 million on option four. Um, that 
essentially includes your construction and labor costs, um, as well as prevailing wage dollars. Now we have different assumptions on each of the uh, different projects for a renovation. Uh, the cost would assume uh, full demolition of the interiors, it has mat remediation, uh, minor structural upgrades of the foundation and roof wall connections to bring it to uh, post Northridge standards. We patch and repair the roofing, um, new exterior windows and doors, patch exterior paint uh, walls. Uh, we do essentially all new interiors, uh, but the but the exterior would essentially be the same. Um, it would have a new fire suppression system, new plumbing, uh, new HVAC, and new electrical. Uh, on the new construction side, which is option four, um, that's pretty self-evident in terms of it's a new building. So it, it would include demo of the existing building and replacement of a new building um, built to with a steel frame building, exterior plaster, storefront, um, and uh, similar interior finishes. Uh, but this building would would give you a little bit more of that uh, long term maintenance um, that you guys are experiencing in other places in the in the city. The marine weather is tough on buildings. So, um, jumping back up to the top, uh, architectural engineering costs. Um, that is your design cost for your architectural services and engineering relative to structural, mechanical, electrical, plumbing, and civil. Uh, program and construction management services is the next line item. Uh, this includes um, having a construction manager, oversee the design teams, uh, bid out the project, manage the construction, represent you um, in behalf of uh, you know, change orders, things like that. Um, environmental, um, our regulatory agency costs, um, going through the process uh, of that and the related fees. Deputy inspection and testing fees are related to um, um, essentially during construction, testing the soils, testing the material strength um, before proceeding with uh, further construction. Uh, we talked about construction line item there. Uh, fixture and furnishings are things like um, office, uh, desks, chairs, conference rooms, uh, racks, anything like that. Um, and then electronic systems could be things like security, um, your um, AV controls, and elements of the like. Okay. And I should also, I should also mention the, the, the last item on there, that little footnote. Uh, we have included escalation in these numbers. And so we're, we're anticipating January of 2023 is the midpoint of construction. So, you know, there, there is a 4% uh, per year premium added into this to anticipate when you go to market, um, you'll have some, some padding there. So if the, if the market changes, there might be some favorable uh, aspects to the city there, but um, there, there is the anticipation that inflation and escalation occurs at that rate. Thank you, uh, Dustin. Sure. So next slide, please. So $250,000 has been allocated in the FY2021 budget to initiate the preliminary design project permitting phase to construct the full replacement option four project. Staff anticipates this phase could take up to several years given the complexity of the site and the design constraints. As shown, this project has been, this project total cost is $9.5 million and has been phased over multiple fiscal years. Next slide. This next set of slides will focus on the community pool. Next slide. So but for, before we go into the community pool, I would like to, uh, the questions have been asked about the McGaw pool and what can be done to, can it be rebuilt? Can it be renovated? Um, and that, that has been studied over the years. An, an aerial, the, uh, the aerial on the left shows the McGaw pool, pool facility limits bounded by the red line. The yellow shaded structure houses the water filtering and pumping equipment. A comprehensive study was commissioned back in 2008 to determine the feasibility of reno renovating or replacing the McGaw pool facility. The bottom line is this, is this study recommended the city replace the existing McGaw pool with a new aquatic 
facility that would ultimately have the amenities to allow the magnitude of uses and mixed uses. This recommendation was based on numerous pool facility components not meeting state code requirements and or needing replacement. For example, one of the primary direct violations of the state health code is lack of dedicated support buildings, such as restrooms. To build this state code required to build to meet the state record requirement, the existing McGaw pool site would have to expand beyond its current limits shown in red, shown as the red lines. To gain additional space, the only option would be to remove the tennis courts. Moreover, based on the discussions at the time with the various user groups, it was determined that the city's programming had evolved to the point where that McGaw pool facility could no longer was no longer sufficient to meet the city's programming goals. With the 2008 st uh, study's findings, the recommendation and recommendations, staff conducted a citywide siting study for placement of a new aquatic center. In the end, it was determined the best suited site to construct a new aquatic center would be the Navy base site. Um, and of course, um, some of the pictures on the left show some of the deficiencies that that um, currently exist in the golf hole beyond the piping. So um, we have some crack, cracking decks, some uh, failing uh, underlying structural steel that's causing some rust stains. Next slide. So once the Navy site was secured, a preliminary uh, design site plan was developed. And this shows you the, uh, the current preliminary plan. Next slide. Okay. Uh, based on the newly developed preliminary community pool design, public outreach was initiated in February 2020, seeking input on the proposed pool design and site layout. As shown, as shown, the comments, as shown, comments expressing both support and concern for the proposed project were received. The next slide show the next set of slides shows su summarizes the results of the public outreach effort. As part of the public outreach workshops, the participants were given red dots and utilized them to vote on the various display boards set up around the room. This, this slide shows one such display board. And of course, how comfortable are you with the city of Seal Beach moving ahead with a community pool? Uh, of the of people in attendance, uh, the people voting, 153 said very comfortable. And of course, it varied on down to uh, 13 saying they weren't comfortable. So that's just an example of some of the presentation slides. Next slide. Um, so let's see. So this is one such, this is another um, display board that was voted on. And uh, as you can see, the activities, place a dot on those features and amenities that you think are most important. Can you, um, can you go back one slide, please? I think we missed a slide. There you go. So um, opinion, should we build a 40 meter option pool? Or should we build a 50 meter pool? People in attendance by far, uh, felt that the 50 meter pool was the uh, option they preferred. Okay, you can go ahead and go forward. Next slide. There you go. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and I'll let Dustin, who developed this co these cost estimates, and uh, go walk him through the detail on how they how he developed them. Dustin, would you please uh, uh, walk through this slide? Yes, sir. Uh, so similar approach as our uh, last one, but a little different nuance uh, to some degree. Um, item one, construction costs being the pool building and site. Now recall that the site that has been talked about over the Navy base um, is about 3.6 acres. Um, it has about a 10,000 square foot pool building, um, as well as the 50 meter pool uh, in option one and a 40 meter uh, what we call a 25 yard stretch pool in option two. Um, it also includes uh, on line item two, replacement of Navy buildings that are currently there, they're storage buildings, and those would have to be replaced as part of the project. Um, your fixtures, furnishing and equipment, what we call FF&E um, is item three, which are again, um, in this regard, we'd have some office equipment for the lifeguards, um, you'd have 
uh, desk for the party room or our tables and chairs, but this also extends out to the pool deck and some of the equipment there. Um, architectural and engineering services, these are your design fees and construction management, special inspections, we've lumped that into one category here. Sure. Um, and then city contingency, um, this was applied 10% for construction and 5% for uh, services or what they're called soft costs. So um, enough to kind of get you guys through to uh, the end of the project. Again, we're escalating this up to the midpoint of construction, which is anticipated for November, 2023. And um, that's all I have for now. Thank you, Dustin. Next slide. So the, um, the project, um, so this slide shows the project annual O&M cost. Uh, of course, the 50 year lease, we, the uh, Navy did a finish, did complete their appraisal and it, uh, and it, and um, the overall cost is 454,000 annually. Now this does not include uh, in-kind contributions. The uh, lease itself is in draft form and has yet to be negotiated. Uh, staffing and operational costs is estimated at 500,000 a year. And then the debt service, which would be based on um, the bond that would be issued to uh, move forward with the project, is estimated at 1.2 million. And miscellaneous incidental is about 100,000 for an annual cost of around $2 million a year. Next slide. So status, uh, community outreach conducted in February, 2020. Uh, however, we were never, the present, the final presentation that recapped everything that was learned was never conducted because, because once we were ready to, once all the data was compiled, the uh, stay at home, COVID-19 stay at home order was issued. We never had a chance to do the final recap of what was learned uh, from the, the overall public outreach effort. Uh, the Navy site appraisal is complete. The draft lease is now ready for, to be reviewed and negotiated. Environmental phase is ongoing. The design phase is on hold. The program management support consultant effort is on hold as well. Next slide. So in so this next two slides will just kind of summarize uh, the, the overall cost we reviewed on these four projects. Uh, the total of 310,000 has been allocated as part of the FY 2021 adopted city budget for the tennis center locker room and lifeguard headquarter and PD substation of preliminary design efforts. Uh, and a total of $587,000 in funding was carried over from FY19 and 20 for the Main Street Improvement Program in the Community Pool Project. Next slide. This table summarizes the proposed project allocations for each of the five capital projects that would be funded directly or indirectly by the general fund. For the, this, this includes $587,000 carryover from FY19 and 20 for a total cost over the five year period of $12.1 million. And that, next slide. So next steps, facilitate in-depth conversation at the next strategic planning meeting. Obtain city council and community input on priorities for these projects. Once priorities are determined, develop a financial financing plan to see the projects through to completion. Next slide. And that concludes my report. Are there any questions? Okay, did anyone have questions for Director Miter? I have a few questions. Okay, Tom. Um, and the, on the one of the first slides, it showed th that there's 1.4 million that's available from the uh, insurance for the restaurant at the end of the pier. But why are we not moving forward with doing something with that? I, I can help. This is Kelly. I can help answer that question. Um, it's not that we're not moving forward with something. We just received that money 
uh, thank you. That's the slide that you're speaking about, correct? The 1396 yeah. um, committed. Um, it's not that we're not moving forward. We just received those funds uh, right at the end of the budget cycle. Um, so we just recorded that commitment as of June 30th. And if you recall, this was one of the items that the council uh, during the strategic planning process in, the, in March um, had asked us as a city to look into, but because of COVID, we haven't been able to start the community engagement process. Um, so it's not that we're not moving forward with it. Uh, it's just that it's it's on hold temporarily until we can commence the community outreach and the conversation around the project. Okay, I just I just noticed that it wasn't kind of in the plans and it, and since we have the money that it might make sense. So that's my comment. Um, and then or for the more detailed discussion, should we wait for the uh, strategic planning meeting then? Well, the council has the option tonight, I mean, to ask questions, um, make comments, but it, again, um, we're not looking for the council uh, at all to consider any action or direction um, to staff with respect to the program tonight. Okay, yeah, and I'll just give my input. Uh, the the tennis center, I thought the 100,000 option looked reasonable, but I'd like to hear from the other council members on that. On the, on the main street, um, I've, I've heard from a lot of residents, does that really need to be redone? They like the way main street is, just a comment. And uh, on, the, on, the, on the PD substation, if we're gonna redo the whole building anyway, I'd, I'd like to at least look at possibility of having a, a, a community room as part of that. And that's the, the pool, I think, um, I, I think that probably needs more detailed discussion at the strategic meeting. So that's all I have. Okay, thank you. Um, Councilman Verapapa, did you have questions? You had a couple of uh, questions and comments. Could you go back to the page that shows a summary of all the projects and the costs with the carryover and everything like that? Just to get a look at that. Do you have that slide? Yeah. Um, it's towards the end, I believe. It's slide 41. Thank you. Would you turn to, uh, please turn to slide 41. There we go. Yeah, that one. As far as the tennis center and locker room are concerned, the gym renovation, you know, I recently went uh, to the tennis center and took a little um, self tour of that locker room. And it just, to me, it seems like that facility and that whole center is such an asset to the city. And it's kind of a diamond in the rough, if you know what I mean. I'd like to, you know, see any way we could to make it, you know, better and brighter and, you know, just a better place to, um, to use because I don't think it's being used to the capacity that it could be. So um, I think that's got a lot of opportunities and it is an asset to our city. I know uh, a lot of people are using that facility. There's been a lot of increase recently in that. And it'd be nice to see it used to its ultimate, um, you know, maximum extreme. As far as the pier abutment restoration renovation, to me, that seems like a safety project and less, the more we wait on that, the more expensive it's gonna be and the un, more unsafe it's gonna be. So definitely a um, important project. The uh, Main Street improvements, you know, that has a lot of benefits, but I think for me, it looks more aesthetic than you know, structurally needed or safety needed or something to that effect. But obviously there's room for improvement. Um, 
I'm not sure about the extent of the improvement, so it'd be nice to revisit that to see where that goes. As far as the lifeguard headquarters and police substation, you know, I'd like to dive into that a little bit more. I'm not sure what we're taking away and what we're replacing. I know a lot of residents put a lot of time and a lot of effort into that substation. And I would hate to see all the work that they did kind of be dissolved, if you will. Uh, I know it'll be, the, it looks like the plan's bigger and better and brighter and all that stuff, but I still like to somehow figure out how that would work and how extensive that is. It's hard to say what, 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 what are the limits with that thing? I mean, we kind of got a plan view, but we didn't get any elevation view. And it just seems like there's obviously a need for some work there. I'm just not sure on the extent of it. The community pool to me is another asset. I know we've been talking about that a long time. So I think uh, the carryover is a good idea and, and revisiting it is obviously a good idea. I think there's a big uh, need for it, obviously, and a lot of people use it. So I think that's important too, but, but I like the plan, you know, I like the carry, carryover ideas and I like the idea of, you know, focusing on, you know, the tennis center and the abutments at this time, just for, you know, for the safety value and the, um, just, you know, making improvements that are needed at the time. So that's kind of all the comments I had. I didn't really have any questions per se, but um, thanks for putting all this together. And it really seems like it's very detailed, but I'd like to get into it a little bit deeper before, you know, I'm, and I'm sure we will just before we start making decisions on, you know, prioritizing and picking and choosing and stuff like that. So thanks again, that's all. Okay, um, <clears throat> Council Member Masalavit, did you have questions? Comments? Council Member Masalavit, are you muted or did you have any comments? I was trying to unmute. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry. That's okay. I'm, um, I am a here and alive. Um, in terms of the tennis center rehab, um, are there really a lot of people that use those showers? Do they have to be there? I know that, um, I, I know a number of people that play tennis there. And I don't think any of them use the shower. And, um, Cause I see them right after their tennis playing and um, they've gone home, taken a shower, and then come to where we were going to meet. But um, I think that's part of the project that would be the most um, or the least used, maybe. I don't know anything about the tennis center. I don't play tennis, and I've never been in it. But... Uh, I think I'm going to have to do that before we make any decisions. Um, the peer abutment, I don't think there's any question that that needs to be done and done soon. Um, it is maybe not an imminent danger, but it looks pretty bad to me. Um, I have been in the lifeguard building. And I'll tell you, it is amazing that those guys can function in that building. Um, it needs to be replaced. That whole operation needs to be replaced uh, and make it right. And um, make it more efficient. Uh, make it easier for the lifeguards to do their work. Um, I think that's another top of the priority list myself. And we get to the pool. I am so in favor of doing the pool, but I got to tell you, this thing is costing a heck of a lot of money 
and I am just not sure anymore about the feasibility of the pool. I, I need to know more about the financing, how we're going to do that, where we're going to come up with the debt service every year. Um, you know, a lot more. I need a lot more about the pool. I love the project, but boy, I'm really hesitant anymore. And I, you know, I talked to some of the people around here and, who use the pool and um, are, you, you know, go to McGaw and they come home and take a shower and clean up. Do we need all of those facilities at the pool? I know it's going to be like a community center, but we need to talk about that a whole lot more. And the, let me back up to the Main Street improvements. I think those are, I think they're pretty reasonable in terms of the scope of work, at least my understanding of it. Um, I don't know that it would cost as much as, as they're saying here, 1.3, 1.4. Um, if we limit what we're doing, uh, I don't know what their scope of services is proposed at. I don't know if anyone does. Perhaps that's something we can talk about at strategic planning, what our vision for Main Street is and um, what we'd like to see happen down there. I know some of the crosswalks are in very poor shape and pedestrians of course are using them and you know if your heel gets caught on a little ridge where a chunk is broken out that's not a good thing so we need to take a look a little more closely at all of these things i just wish i could come up with some kind of solution but i can't not now not yet that's all Okay, thank you. All right, Mayor Pro Tem Kalmyk, do you have questions, comments? I have uh, a few comments. Uh, one of the things that I think I would like to see teased out as we, you know, go into the strategic planning, um, in speaking with uh, many, many residents, since we've had a lot of time to digest the uh, last discussions about the pool and now uh, the lifeguard headquarters, uh, you know, I think a lot of people don't have a full understanding of the difference between building a residence and building a public facility. Uh, you know, I look at at the lifeguard headquarters tab of nine and a half million dollars and it's very easy to say well what's there i mean you know you could build you know three houses on the gold coast uh for much less than that including the value of the land but i th it's obvious that there are restrictions there are lots of things that you have to do when you're building um, a commercial uh, or government building beyond the prevailing wages, whether it's the baseboards or the facilities that you have to have. And so I think it, it would be worth the effort to just, you know, tease that out a little bit more. Same thing with the pool. Um, you know, why is it, you know, why does it cost, you know, $800,000 for inspection? and so forth you know how how do how have these things sort of evolved to become major portions you know of the cost uh, and i think it would help in the discussion so we could avoid you know uh, reject wanting to reject these projects out of hand because people don't feel that there's any value there financially you know and and make it uh, make the discussion more productive and make the decisions um, the tennis center, uh, as Sandra has said, you know, I've myself have not been there and don't play tennis there, but I think that, um, beyond making a decision regarding the use of the locker facilities and, and having that kind of analysis, I think is, is certainly worthwhile, you know, but I also want to, um, 
have our buildings and our public facilities be built to last longer and also to look good. You know, to, to just operate on the poor me principle, um, you know, sometimes can wind up costing you more money in the long run. And I would, um, you know, express those sentiments even with regard to the Main Street improvements. You know, I realize it's a very amorphous topic since we're not talking about building certain things. But, you know, overall, keeping our Main Street quaint and small townish is great, but not to the point where things start becoming decrepit. Um, you know, the intersections are in horrible shape and they cannot be repaired. And by the same token, there are alternatives in terms of design that could help, um, you know, bring the three blocks into more of a cohesive unit. There's all kinds of new materials and so forth that can be used, signage, um, alternative, you know, ideas on lighting and so forth that would make the, uh, you know, the shopping and dining experience for the visitors and us as residents much more enjoyable and keep the, the idea uh, at perpetuating of our small quaint town. Um, you know, we, we can already, uh, you know, catalog specific increases in costs to maintain the bricks as an example. We don't gain any aesthetic uh, improvements by the monies that we spend every year to uh, fix the bricks to keep people from tripping over them. Um, I think we've noticed, you know, with the uh, the outside dining and so forth that the sidewalks, you know, can get kind of crowded and maybe there's other alternatives to our sidewalks um, that we can look at. So I, I, I really, even though it be, Aside from the fact that it's my district and I live downtown, I think that um, you know Main Street is is kind of the soul of our town, and we should look at the things that can help perpetuate that. And improvements do not mean change necessarily. Um, the pier abutment, absolutely, you know that that's kind of basic to the way uh, you know the whole pier area looks. And, uh, you know, I mean, we have a situation where we couldn't even replace um, two of the lights uh, on the pier because there's no concrete there to support bolting them down. So they're being stored right now. So I, I, I feel we really need to go full steam ahead and, you know, look at doing something, uh, you know, to where the bathrooms can be more operational you know even in the light of abuse by visitors and people but to make that you know not so bad as a public bathroom uh let's see community pool pier button and tennis center i think that pretty much covers uh what we're doing and and i really uh like this approach where this is a case where it's okay to beat a horse to death discussing it because you know we need to we need to get everybody's opinion in this in some of the, those major capital expenditures and and have a, a good idea of of how we're going to project you know our costs and how they're going to be financed what the proposals are for that and you know what what a reasonable outcome would be for those things. So, you know, I think we can go into much more depth um, during the, um, you know, our strategic planning meeting. And hopefully we will be back to a situation where we can meet, you know, with our, amongst ourselves and with our community, you know, on a face-to-face -face basis. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. Um, my feeling, my feelings are, you know, to pr probably similar to to Joe's in some regards that I think I think further discussion is good, especially uh, on some of the really large numbers. And I think I really am not comfortable committing to a large cost without looking at our our financial picture and what what that's expected to look like to see if we can afford what kind of costs we can afford. Um, but 
I, I also think that, you know, when it, when it comes to something like the Main Street Project, maybe the COVID experiences, you know, there's some changes that have happened and maybe we'll have some different kind of ideas going forward. But I would like to um, also get, can make sure we can get some community input when we have the community back being able to get back together again and ask their questions and give their input. So postponing a little bit uh, longer till hopefully we can get through the COVID a little bit more. Uh, I, I'm in favor of that and give it, letting us get a little bit more uh, look. Um, I, you know, as far as, uh, I agree as far as the peer abutment, uh, that, that can go ahead and move forward. Uh, the tennis center, you know, I, I uh, I think it it can even sit a little bit. It it's 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 it obviously needs to have something. It can't live with plastic and plywood forever. But uh, um, you know, I I think um, I think the I think a minimal uh, uh, fix on it is is probably would be all right too. So, but I I would like to get some some more community input. So hopefully we can. Get that. So I look forward to the strategic planning meeting. And I think that is all. Okay. Um, does anyone have any any additional comments, questions, anything else to add? No? Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we will move on to new business. We'll move on to item J, report on Orange County Vote Centers and ballot drop box in Seal Beach. Um, we'll call upon City Clerk Harper to give us this report. Thank you, Mayor. And tonight I'll just be giving an update on a report on the Orange County Vote Centers and the ballot drop box located in the city of Seal Beach. I'm kind of waiting for the slide and it shall be up in a minute. But I'll go ahead and get started. As a result of the Voters Choice Act of 2016, which is also known as SB 450, several voting options are now available for the November 3rd presidential election. Those options include more than 200 vote centers throughout the County of Orange, flexible voting schedule, which I'll touch on a little bit later, vote by mail ballots for all registered voters, as well as 110 or more secure ballot drop boxes throughout the county. Next slide, please. Based on the requirements set forth in the statute, the vote centers must, have act, must be accessible to voters with disabilities, meet the multiple language needs requirement of the cities, location availability, it must have adequate lighting, secure, it must be secure, must have short-term parking, and be close to public transportation. Next slide, please. All registered voters will receive a vote by mail ballot 28 days prior to the, to the election. The delivery of the ballots will be by US mail and they will start to go out on October 5th. And the ROV of Orange County has stated that they should complete the mailing by October 10th. Voters will have three ways to return their ballots. They can mail in the ballot, they can drop it off in one of the secure county ballot drop boxes, or they can vote at a vote center in the county. I want to make clear that um, you understand that you will not be, you will not be precluded, I'm sorry, this will not preclude you, the voter, from casting their ballot in person at any vote center. Next slide, please. What you can expect at the vote center for the next upcoming election there's two centers here in Seal Beach. There's one at the fire station, number 48, and it's gonna be a five-day vote center. And the second one is a five-day vote center at the Mary Wilson Branch Library, located at 707 Electric Avenue. The days and hours of operation for both of, the, both of the facilities will be Friday, October 30th through Monday, November 2nd, from 8 a.m. until 8 p.m. 
and on election day, November 3rd, from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. Next slide, please. At the Vote Center, it will serve as a one-stop location for all things voting. Can you go back one slide, please? The Vote Centers will allow residents not to, own, not, to not only vote, but to receive a replacement ballot, drop off mail-in ballot, vote in person, or receive general assistance from the ROV staff. Next slide, please. Oh, you're already there. Back one slide, please. This is a picture of a typical vote center. In each vote center, there's several stations and it, they're set up with dedicated and highly trained staff to assist the voters. At the vote center, you have the option to surrender your ballot at a vote center and at, at a vote center and receive a printed ballot for markup with a pen and drop in the ballot box. Also, election staff will offer you an I voted sticker after you've dropped your ballot in the drop box. Next slide, please. This year, the ROV has added what they call a mega voting location, which will be located at the Senior Center. I'm sorry, at the Honda Center. At this location, voters will have several convenient, convenient options for casting their ballot or returning their ballots. This option will include voting in person, receiving a replacement ballot. You can also register to vote but I want you to know that the last day to register the vote is October 19th. You can also update your registration. There will be drive-through voting and you can drop off your vote by mail ballot. I also wanted to talk about the pop-up vote centers. This year, I know that there will be one at Leisure World, but that date and time has yet to be released. Next slide, please. Here you will see a color-coded map of the vote centers throughout the county. And I mean, if I go ahead to the next slide, you will see that there's a legend that talks about what these different colors mean. The yellow is the mega, mega vote center, which is the Honda Center. The orange is the regular vote center where you have to walk in. The green represents the drive-through vote center. And then the purple represent the pop-up voting. And again, there will be one in Leisure World and those dates and time is to be announced at another, at a later time. Next slide, please. What you have here is the official ballot drop box that's located right here in front of the Mary um, Wilson Library, which was installed last December by ROV. This drop box will be open for 24 hours, seven days a week, beginning October 5th through election day on Tuesday, November 3rd. Ballots will be picked up every other day starting Monday, October 5th through Friday, October 23rd. And then starting on October 24th, there will be daily pickups up, pick through election day. The ballot pickup schedule is subject to change to daily pickups earlier, depending on the volume of the ballots received. Like I said earlier, residents can cast their ballots anytime, anywhere at any of the 110 ballot drop boxes throughout the county. I just wanted to remind you that the drop boxes are secure, they're accessible to voters with disabilities, and they're located close to public transportation, and it is postage free. Lastly, I'd just like to remind you that if you are a resident of Orange County, you must use a vote center or a ballot drop box in Orange County to ensure that your vote will count. I also wanted to let you know that this information will be available on the city's website. Next slide, please. This concludes my report and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you, City Clerk Harper. Are there any questions for um, the City Clerk? Uh, just one question. Okay. Is, uh, in Station 48, there's no drop box, is that correct? That is correct. There's only one drop box in Seal Beach, and that's at the Mel Mary Wilson Library. Okay, thank you. That's it. Okay, anybody else have a question? Okay, well, thank you very much for your, uh, for your report. Uh, and this is a receive and file item, so you don't need to take any action on that. And we'll move on to adjournment. We will adjourn the City Council to Monday, October 12th, 
2020 at 5.30 p.m. to meet in closed session if deemed necessary. Thank you very much for attending and have a good night. Thank you. Good night, thank you. Good night, everybody.